Hello, everyone. This is Greg Lokers and Mike Rippey with Scapegoat. We're going to be looking at the work of Molly Siegel today um, of one of her recent shows called Marrow Sucker. Um, I don't believe this show is up any longer, but it was recently up earlier this year. Um, so yeah, I'm going to cycle through some of the installation shots and then we're going to look at some of the specific pieces. Um, I am an acquaintance of Molly Siegel. I, I attended the School and Museum of Fine Arts for one year while she was there as well. And I've always, and I've been in several shows with her and I'm always intrigued by the way in which she, well, I, I, so I've been thinking about, I don't like using the term beauty and ugliness. I've been thinking about attraction and repulsion. And there's some really interesting elements here of attraction and repulsion. You can kind of see it with these works. Almost all of them are some sort of water-based paint. Sometimes it's watercolor. Sometimes I think she uses gouache. And almost all of it is on a, a Japanese paper that's called a yuppo paper, which is a highly durable paper that can receive wet materials like watercolor and uh, it really preserves the, you know, nothing gets soaked into the paper. So instead it dries kind of on top. Um, and it, it really has an interesting, you're able to get these textures like you can see here in this painting. I think she considers them paintings. I consider them paintings. I would consider them paintings also. Yeah. Some people would say like water-based material on paper is more like ink drawing, but Either way. Yeah, I mean, I could see the works on paper argument, but to me, they're paintings. I've always considered watercolor painting. This is one of, we'll have to come back to this one. I, I really like this one. And does she hang those with magnets? Is that what those little dots are up there? Yeah, they're magnets, yeah. Okay. I know like, I, I think most people who collect them end up framing them. A lot of times they'll frame them in those acrylic boxes that are like very, uh, allow the work to kind of still be itself while protecting it from mm -hmm. yeah. touch. That's one of the things about these works on Yuppo is like, you can watch and you see she's playing with this in these moments where like it's getting washed away. Like you can, you can really, you can almost get back to the, perfect paper by just washing it with water mm -hmm. so they can be relatively fragile i really like this one as well but we'll get back to why So were there any ones that you're interested in, Mike, starting with? Um, I think the tires one with the people going at it is one. <laughs> yeah. And so I guess we can just start here. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, what I'm seeing is like, you know, the windmills, it looks like a desert area, this kind of, un, you know, uh, with the, with the tires, it seems like a wasteland, like a dump or something. Mm. Um, the pink, the large pink line through the, the kind of undulating landscape is interesting. I don't know. I'm about to think more on what that means to me. Um, and then you have the figures down there kind of in a, like some kind of orgy, which it looks like there's more than two people, but the, you can only really see the two in the front. And it looks like there's another person off to the right, but they're having their little, you know, party down there. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm not... So we talked about this a little bit and it does have that kind of environmentalist feel to it, like the wasteland and the tires. And that's obviously, you know, you know, not good for the environment. And then you have the juxtaposition of the windmills and about how those are supposed to be, you know, healthy and cleaner for the environment. 
And then you have these people down there kind of enjoying each other. And I'm, I mean, this seems somewhat superficial to me. <laughs> you know, it mm. seems like, uh, like a fight between good and evil to some degree, like the tires represent kind of the bad things and the windmills, you know, represent the good things. And then you have kind of the people just kind of laying there kind of just in the environment and kind of oblivious to it to some degree. I mean, they're out in the open, which is a little odd but it seems very hedonistic, you know, like they could be on an island somewhere by themselves and they're just kind of, you know, enjoying nature. And maybe that's the, maybe that's the point is that they're supposed to be the, the more natural things in the scene. Like mm -hmm. this is a natural thing that happens and, you know, not, you know, I wouldn't say like a bunch of people like that, but, you know, it's, you know, it's 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 natural you know for people to engage in sexual activity and things like that so yeah yeah well, maybe this that's the nature part but i'm in and, and i like the abstraction i like the abstraction of the environment like i like the the texture of the the kind of rolling hill and the kind of cemented area on the bottom left i, I like the texture that's involved with that and the colors mm -hmm. also the use of watercolor uh and the gauche is uh to me like refers to like bodily fluid to some degree so i think that even helps push this idea of like the flesh and you know the kind of act that these people are engaged in yeah that's what there's so much so to me like one of the reasons why i enjoy looking at molly's work is the kind of like i was saying attraction versus repulsion and how there's some degree of honesty in the, the, the visceralness and the kind of like, you know, like I think about depictions of sex in say a Hollywood film. It's so like pure and beautiful. And it's like, that's not really how much sex goes. You know, it, it's, it's far more bodily. It's far more fluid and grainy. And then for her to use these different, techniques on this paper to for it to highlight the graininess of even the paint there's something about showing a more um a more honest view of you know like i think about watercolors are frequently so soft and so airy and then it's like this is just grainy and and especially the title what i need was more what i needed was more there's something where it's like this is, I don't think anyone in this painting, right? These, these humans involved in this interaction, they're not satisfied. It's not like this, you know, wonderful, the, the sort of love scene in a Hollywood film where it's like the, all of the, the frustrations and the difficulties and the finally meeting, you know, the meet cute, the two people coming together kind of like, solidified in a sexual encounter where they're just so filled with euphoria. This is like fulfilling an animalistic need. Yeah, you know what? And I was starting to think about that. I was thinking about how this almost is degrading to some degree because they're right next to this, you know, hill of trash. Yeah. And it's almost like they're wild animals, like just walking around a trash heap, you know, just looking to looking for food or looking for some kind of quick satisfaction, you know? Yeah. So they, they don't even like, they don't even come across completely after you start thinking about it a little more as even human. It's just like this pure, right. like, um, animal attraction. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. no, there's no human dis discernment here. It's just, this is what you do. You just start going around humping and eating things. <laughs> right. It reminds me, there's this weird movie called, I think it's called The Bad Batch. It's got Jason Mama in it. And it's like this post-apocalyptic desert world where like some sort of law, you know, uh, criminals are sent to this place and it's just this lawless prison that is a desert. But then the whole film is shot as if it's like some sort of, you know, like, 
high-end fashion like everyone's beautiful even though they have things like amputees and missing limbs and all of this stuff it's so like pretty no one has dirt on them their hair is always perfect jason moma is like a sculpture of a, of a human being you know and then the, to me it's like this is this is far more like when i think of like t.s Eliot's wasteland like that's the sort of thing that i feel in this like that no like there are there there is there's a repulsiveness in our reality in our world and if you just you know if you just slap lipstick on a pig you're you're lying mm -hmm. and like honestly i never finished that movie because i thought it was dumb like it was just like this isn't like i would rather see something that was brutally honest something like children of men in the film realm the, the film children of men where it's just like we're getting down in the muck because that's where we all live and it makes me think like to move you know here's a detail to move to i do like that one but this one i think is really similar because we've got another uh sexual scene occurring and there's something about you know there's roller coasters and these are old mining equipment I think specifically coal mining. Like I've seen those kind, that kind of equipment at coal mines. And then the title counterweight. There's something about, you know, I, I think I think our conversation will have to head towards that last painting of the birds, because there's something hopeless here, and I want to know is is this just a wallowing in the hopelessness of specifically like a consumerist materialistic culture of thinking of the earth as something that we can mine of thinking of even like these i think in particular like because like i see this as both males and females walking like zombies towards what appears to be one woman who is clearly being used for sexual gratification and so it's like it's like human beings are just as mineable as the the ground that those that those mining structures are mining and it's like the air of a roll like a roller coaster is mining the air to get pleasure mm -hmm. like can we get can we float up in the air and extract something from it just like we can extract from the ground and just like we can extract from the human body right but to me the people those people don't look like they're you know, enjoying themselves at all. It's just a, it's just an act, you know, it's yeah. just, it's just purely just having sex for the sake of having sex. And, I, and it even seems like they're doing it for a purpose beyond what they're, they're doing it for. It seems, you know, it just doesn't seem like it's, uh, it seems like work, you know, <laughs> like it seems, yeah. so it doesn't really even seem like it's something that's enjoyable or something that it was, you know, kind of, you know, that you would, that you would, you know, imagine it to be like, it's just, yeah. it's just function, you know, right. and, uh, and then seeing the mining equipment in the background and, and the carnival mm -hmm. rides, you know, they don't look very functional. The carnival rides don't look functional. I mean, almost, it almost looks like an afterthought that those things were put back there. <clears throat> and maybe that's, maybe that's, the idea is that the, the the pleasurable part is an afterthought in this scene. It's not anything that you really are aspiring for. It's just, you know, working and digging and getting your hands dirty. And it's just, it's almost like you don't really want to do it, but it's something you have to do to get the work done, you know. So, and plus again, the, and this one is even, in my opinion, a little more, you know, disturbing because of the colors it's like this brown you know muddy you know dirty color that and it's just running down the 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 paper so it's you know it's just there's nothing about it that's very pleasing i mean the the technique is is nice and i like the way you know the things were represent like the way the drawing is done and and the way the figures are represented i think those you know as far as like um a good style or skill i think that's a they're, they're really well done yeah <laughs> but the this, the subject matter to me is just 
is very depressing. <laughs> right. Well, and this to me gets to the conversation. I have this with my students all the time. And I think lots of people who are sort of outside the art world would probably like be, they would, they would wonder why I have such a fascination with looking at quite disturbing artwork frequently. And it's something about, it's not like, I, like there is not a part of me that enjoys looking at this. I've always been, the, she has, there's one of them in here, these, these images of the thistles. Those to me are the most sort of like, I could actually live with that artwork and not be uh, affronted by it all the time. But there's something like, there's no way I could live with this image, but I also don't need to because it's so powerful that I can't stop thinking about them once I've already seen them. And even if I don't remember all the details, they're just so visceral that it's like, it confronts me and I have to deal with it because I think, I think there's lots of ways you can read into this work, but I think one of the things you need to confront is um, are human beings a cancer on the planet that is just mindlessly hedonistically consuming everything we touch you know like i i think for me i was young when the matrix came out and that was a super powerful film and like you know one of the ai agent guys says you know human beings are a parasite and everywhere they go they just like mm -hmm. you know, devour everything and move on to the next and the the reason that's such a powerful statement and the reason why this image is so is so stuck in my mind is that there is a part of that that is definitely true. We do that. We strip mine mountains. I've seen it. You know, we, we degrade people. We, you know, the Holocaust happened, slavery happened, all of these horrible things. But, and then, so to me, it's like, is that all we are? Like this painting is called counterweight and I can't see a single counterweight in it. Right. It seems all one side. Yeah. It's like, we are monsters. We're the monsters. Yeah. And that's where I'm like, and, and I'm even the show title marrow sucker. Like, you know, I think about those moments, like there's a scene in God, why am I, I'm all filmed today. Uh, you are. <laughs> I know there's a scene in Lord of the Rings where uh, the, the, whatever, the guy that oversees Gondor, I just, I just know that actor really well. And he's eating and he's, it's such this visceral scene of like tomatoes popping in his mouth and like bones of chickens and whatnot. And it's like, that's like, it's like this, you know, like you're eating with your hands in this sense. If you're sucking marrow from bones, it's not like some nicely, someone cut the bone in half and scraped it out onto the silver platter. This is like, you snap that bone and you were sucking it straight from that jagged piece. And that's where it's like, it's, it confronts me. I like, I, I, it's, not a, it's not a pleasure in beauty. There's, this, isn't, this isn't attractive to me, but I like that it challenges me and it makes me think. And I think that is a power in artwork that that is more likely to get me to reconsider some of my actions, especially when it comes to ecological impact, perhaps more so than like, you know, a French Rococo painting of a person swinging on a swing in the, in the beautiful forest or something, you know, like, wow, talk about like an, a depiction of an oil spill or something. And then seeing all of those, I mean, in the context, I think they're telephone poles, but look at it, like they're, they're crucifixes. Yeah. And they're like falling and it's like a geological formation is occurring. The title of the, of the series too is the, the Marrow Sucker title is also, you know, it's something that when you're sucking the marrow out of a bone, like you're trying to get every last bit of nutrients from something, you know? So, yeah. and, and it's for yourself. So it's like a self to sustain yourself. And, you know, I don't, I don't always look at that as negative. I, you know, you could 
flip it around and say that you're, you know, you've killed this animal and you're trying to use every last bit of the animal to, to, to respect the animal, I guess, because we're all, you know, predators and, you know, that's what we do. We're not, right, right. We're not built to, you know, just eat vegetables and, you know, fruits all the time. But I mean, people would argue against that, but it's, you know, biology. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this little smoke study, um, to me, it, it does look more like an oil spill kind of situation. Like the, the waves have kind of crested over a, you know, an area of sand or something. And you see kind of the, the, you know, you see like some blue in there. You definitely see the black at the edges, which kind of represent that idea of like an oil spill or something. Uh, the smoke, you know, I can kind of see that also, but it, to me, it looks more like waves. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's just another dingy, dirty scene of, you know, some environment, you know, environment that's, you know, doesn't look healthy, you know? Right. And like you said, those definitely look like crosses in the background. You can, to the right, you can kind of see that uh, it looks like a, Actually, now that I look at it, it almost looks like a Statue of Liberty, but I think it looks like a lighthouse also. Mm. And then further out, it looks like, I can't really tell what that is. It looks like an electrical line or something like, but anyway, it's just, I don't know. I don't, like, like you said, I don't know if I could actually live with these kind of images. This one isn't as obnoxious as the other ones are, you know, as far as like what they're trying to get across. But uh you know, because I can still appreciate the texture here and the way the the watercolor uh, kind of lays on the the paper. So I I do like this one more just because I can appreciate. And I don't you know if I ignore what the artist is trying to maybe imply with this, I can appreciate the symbolism. You know, but uh, yeah, they do seem very kind of. Um, You know, they definitely have a point that maybe I don't completely agree with. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't consider the world like disposable or, or irredeemable, you know? So. Yeah. I wonder, that's interesting that you say that. Cause I, I mean, I, I don't know Molly very well, but I don't think, she, I don't think she thinks that either. I think she thinks the world's been treated like it's disposable. Mm -hmm. I think about that too. Like when you're talking about marrow and like, you know, in, in hunting cultures in particular, there's like a responsibility in killing something. And so using everything is a way to respect it. So it's not like we're just killing 10 things in order to feed our family. It's like we're killing one thing and we're, we're using the whole thing so that no part of it is waste. And then I think about if you take that same practice and you bring it to say like a farm and you think about sustainable practices in farming, you wouldn't, you know, use chemicals that would end up having long lasting effects on the soil. You wouldn't leach things and you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you would, you would farm responsibly. And that to me is like, this is not a statement of marrow sucking because you're respecting a the death of a creature this is marrow sucking because you're like insatiably hungry and you won't stop consuming like like a burning like a fire burning a land and that's where i'm like to, the thing that i wonder about is um is there any hope in this work you know is this work basically saying we have already sucked the world dry we've already taken the marrow out or is this work saying, if we're careful with how we treat people and how we treat the world and all of that, maybe there's still some, some, some way to relieve it. And that may, maybe that's an interesting time to come to this one. Name all the monsters you've killed. It's because to me, this one is the most um, not disgusting. It feels, it feels there's, you know, that I see that figure up in the top right that feels 
ominous. It looks like they're, it looks a little bit like Casper David Friedrich's guy standing on top of the mountains looking out across the clouds. So like I, I read it as like the back is facing us. And then this sort of group of people and someone traversing some sort of mountainous path towards a gathering in the mist. It's like, is this, is this a piece that's trying to say like we can, we can change and we can ascend the mountain and become better people in the context of this whole body of work? Yeah, I mean, I, I, going back to some of the other things you said, like the, you know, humans are considered parasites and this idea that we can overcome, you know, I, I tend to believe that, that, you know, that we aren't harming the earth as much as we want to believe we are. I think that's very, you know, human centered outlook on things is that we can have, we have so much power that we are actually harming the earth to that degree to where we're sucking the marrow out. I mean, I, 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 and I, I understand your point of view, and maybe this is the same point of view as the artist, but I think it's kind of odd that we believe we could, we people can actually suck the marrow out of the earth. Like, I think that's very conceited, you know, mm -hmm. like, I think it's just, it makes us feel more important. You know, it's always this idea that we're going to put ourselves at the, at the top of the food chain, you know, when the earth is actually in the universe is actually going to destroy us before we have an, even an inkling of a chance to destroy it. You know what I mean? Hmm. So to me, it's like, you know, I can get worked up about, you know, oil spills and things like that. And, you know, I am more than happy to do whatever I can to prevent those things from happening. But for me, the bottom line is always, you know, we are a part of a system whether we think our technology is destroying the earth or not, it's still a part of a system. And, you know, we had the dinosaurs, they were wiped out by an asteroid. The same thing could easily happen to us, you know? So it's not like we have like full control over the planet and that we're constantly pulling the levers of technology to like make it better or make it worse. I think we're a part of that same system. So when I think of technology, I don't think of it as being this kind of outside thing that you know is beyond like it from from our perspectives i don't think it's beyond god you know what i mean i don't think we've created devices that god never you know saw coming you know what i mean right right, right. Well, so that can... we're the ones pulling all the levers and making all the decisions it's to me this is a part of of a, a timeline that's goes on you know and it's it's never ending so you know well, so that, that to me is why i think this work is interesting because there's a lot of work that I would put in the category of environmental activism and whether or not you agree with it, it you know, like, like I think about, um, uh, who was it who put the icebergs during, in front of the G8 summit and like the piece of the chunks of ice just slowly melted, like a super powerful piece. Yeah. I don't but know who that me, is, but that sounds really cool. <laughs> you know, like to me, this piece or these works are not just about the environment. That's why I'm so intrigued by them is because regardless of what you think about the, the actual problems, mm -hmm. what I think Molly's getting at is that idea of respecting something and loving it versus abusing and extracting it. And to me, that's what these works are about is you could, you could talk about any realm, you know, if you want to, whether it's the environment or if you want to talk about, say, political discourse. Are we engaging in a marrow sucking discourse where we are, you know, trying to bend our, our political opponents over by a pile of burning tires? Or are we trying to engage, you know, with, with love, honestly? That to me is like the, 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 that to me is the kind of challenge of this work of, I don't even think it's just about the earth. I, I... It's interesting too, though, because, you know, you, you can go in that direction with this work and you can also go in the direction of, I mean, the, the people are not the focus of the, 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 the it's, it's the environment. And we're just little actors in these environments that she's created. And yep. she actually makes us less human in them. You know, she makes us, you know, not, you know, the human part that makes us reflect on things 
she makes us into these little animals that are just kind of like ants on an anthill, you know, they're just kind of doing their thing. And, and sure, ants can be very destructive also, but they're also, you know, doing, you know, what they're meant to do. And so to me, I could even flip this around and saying that she's actually exposing that, you know, whether she likes it or not, this is what human beings do. They just, they, they tear down, you know, houses or uh, sorry, they tear down hills and they tear down mountains and they go into the earth and they pull things out of it and they, you know, spread it around and cause chaos. And that's just what human beings do. And maybe she doesn't like that, you know, that, and that's fair. There's a lot of things that people do that I don't like either, but maybe that's just kind of what she's trying to expose here also is like, this is what we do. This is, you know, and, and, and like I said, maybe some people can accept the fact that we do this stuff, but then at the same time, you know, you can be like, you know, let's try to be a little more, like you said, loving and caring and respectful at the same time. So, you yeah, know, this is good that, that we're disagreeing because it actually makes me think about the work even more. And, and I think it's actually allowing the work to do more maybe than either one of us thought it could. Well, and that's where I think we have to, we have to come and figure out what the birds are about. Because the, the presence of the bird suddenly, especially in this one where it's like a tidal wave, like I read this as a tidal wave, not a, it might be smoke, like as if this place is all on fire. But it, to me, it's more like a flood coming over and, and, you know, the birds are the things escaping. And it says no one wants to be the last to leave. And I think there's, there's something about this where it's like, <clears throat> if there's, out of all of the elements in the paintings, Yeah, even some of the birds, look how some of the birds are like airplanes rather than birds. Mm -hmm. It's like, like it, it, if I showed this to, to, you know, someone who wasn't well-versed in contemporary art and kind of knew the, the frequent use of, of that which is repulsive, I think someone would be like, this is a beautiful painting. It's, it's yeah. really it's, it's attractive. It's like the one moment where the ugliness and the graininess of her mediums are not present. It's like the one, the one where I'm like, yeah, if someone didn't buy this work, like how, how could this be the work that doesn't get sold, so to speak in the show? It's right. like most positive, the most, the least offensive. And, uh, and it's really funny in the context of like, the art world of, you know, like the, the joke that Portlandia had in something like 2014 or something like that, of like put a bird on it. You know, if, if Molly was just making paintings of birds like this, I would be like, that's pretty cliche. But suddenly this one painting in the context of the whole entire show, and I'm like, no, there is hope here. Yeah. You know, that first, that first painting, what was it titled again? It was, uh, what I needed was more this painting is somehow an answer or, or a try at an answer to what it is that is needed. And it's literally, you know, in the one before, it's literally a transcendence, a leaving, right. leaving behind and flying away. And it's like I, a conversion because you don't see people anymore. You see birds. So it's like you still see an animal. You see, you still see this generic life form you know what i mean yeah. and it, but it's converted from this you know this hedonistic you know the, the representations of the, of the of the people are more hedonistic or they're trying to get like they're trying to ascend that mountain or that hill and they're never going to do it you know maybe that's her maybe that's her uh, her uh, sim symbolism is that the humans are never going to get there but the birds actually escape everything and right. fly right. off and they le actually leave the frame of the image and they go into some other other place god oh my gosh look it's virtue it's like that virtue signaling kind of thing because it's called um oh these are good ones to talk about too it's called name all the monsters you've killed it's like that's what you're doing when you're like well i you know like let's talk about the environmentalism thing like i recycle i got an electric car i put solar panels on my roof it's like you're talking about all the things you've done to climb higher 
and it, but it's still individual focused. It's you moving away. You're still consuming in some way. And the birds, they just, they, they flock together, right? You know, they, they move together. Yeah. They respond to each other and they, they think of the other. Like this is, this is a far more, you know, if, if you want to think about the sexual images before, it's like this is a far more loving encounter with another being. Mm-hmm. And it's not self-centered. Um, you know, there's some, it's, and then maybe we've always been alone. It's like, that maybe is really important. I, I disagree. You know, I don't think she's saying that. I think she's, right. I think she's acknowledging that there is some togetherness in this flock. Mm-hmm. There's some more, more connecting thing then because, and you may that's a really good observation with the word maybe because you take the word maybe out and it says we've always been alone and you think of these birds as individual birds at that point but you put maybe we've always been alone it's it's them it's their reflection on themselves and then they just all they have to do is look around and and answer that you know implied question you know that right. no we're not alone you know that's that's cool i like that well, and it speaks to just the, the strength of unity. You know, whatever your problem, again, like if, whatever your problem is, is unity, selflessness. There's something about look, look at the birds, consider the birds that can be really helpful there. So let's look at some of the other, uh, I mean, we, we, created a pretty good narrative <laughs> with those with the images we looked at right yeah but we didn't look at some of these well. other ones that are kind of like you know single objects you know <laughs> yeah yeah let's take a look at this one. Ooh, even i mean this continues to feed that no match for the air mm-hmm. it's really really like archetypal kind of you know thinking about like going back to um like even Egyptian culture of like the, I think it's Horus, who's the, the um, it's like a falcon or there's like a specific type of bird that right. is around Egypt, but that kind of like thing that can be far more seeing compared to the, the beasts of the earth who can't, who can't get off the ground. Well, and it's interesting in the context of all the power lines and, and windmills and coal fat, coal mining, equipment it's like the only way human beings can can get into the air is if we burn the earth in order to get up there there's you know this almost feels petrified the 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 water the the paint and everything around it feels like we're looking at stone not dirt yeah it almost looks like it's been like an archaeological site or something like that. Yeah. Although there is like that faint, you know, like pigment around there that looks like a little reddish or like decayed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it still has some of the skin and fur on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is interesting. I mean, I could, I could see having this like in my house and just having it hanging around. Mm. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about the single object ones like this one and some of the other ones. It's you know, in context to the other ones, I just think about decay and death and in in you know the the circle of life kind of you know kind of goofy yeah. Yeah. You know, idea. But uh, let's look at this one. See, this one's a little more interesting because that barbed wire in the back and it shows kind of more human, a human hand in it. Um, I feel like she's the most kind of dangerous. Right. She's like the most painterly in this one where like we see some brush strokes. The other times it's more like she's letting the material uh, like be geological so to speak as it like is just it's like we see the liquid drying but in this it feels like she's controlling it more you know the funny thing is and this doesn't have really had to do with any of the subject matter 
<clears throat> it's the way she paints and the way she lets the drips kind of just run down and there's like splashiness on it. Like you can see some random like blobs of paint everywhere else. Like I like that, mm -hmm. but I think there are people out there that would be like this. She just did not do a good job. Like why is, why is there dripping watercolor coming down the side? I like, you know, I know that's a stylistic kind of thing. And I think, and I, and that's one that I enjoy. But I think there are other people out there that just aren't, you know, comfortable with, I, I know for a fact that there are people out there that like cannot get past formalism and that they need to see things that are clean and representational and there can't be any distractions. You know what I mean? Right. And if they, if they see like, there's like, if I see uh, like with photography, if there are things that are not perfectly done with photography, like if it's not like an Ansel Adams photograph, but it doesn't matter what the subject matter is, it could be like the best subject matter on the planet, not just mountains or whatever. But if it's not done in that formalist approach, that people just dismiss it as just bad art, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I totally disagree with them. <laughs> yeah, I, I disagree also, but it's yeah. this is the one. This is a perfect example of that. Is that for me those those that running uh, watercolor actually adds more to the painting than it do, than it detracts from. Yeah, I don't know how to explain that to people. <laughs> right, right. To me, so I've got this I've got this chalkboard of things I write down and maintain in my studio. I totally, this is the worst because I'm an academic and I should remember to cite my sources. This was from a writer, I don't remember who, <laughs> but he says, write naked. That means to write whatever you would not say. Write in blood as if ink is so precious you can't waste it. Write in exile as if you are never going to get home again and you have to call back every detail. And I'm like, that's where this kind of thing, this sort of speed this kind of, um, it's interesting because it's, it's a contrast of both speed and patience, considering like something like a, a painting in acrylic or, you know, designing on the computer and getting your image perfectly balanced and then letting it come out. There's something about like a, an immediacy, a, 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 uh, a need, yeah, that kind of, and especially with content like this, it, it is, it, it couldn't have been meticulously weighed like an Ansel Adams photograph and still communicated such a degree of um, a challenge for the viewer to wrestle with the actual ugliness of lots of parts of our world. And, you know, if it was meticulously painted, completely beautiful. Even if she really is, like even if we're wrong and she really is incredibly intentional and controlling with all of those drips, it doesn't read that way. We can't see that. It reads haphazard. It reads like this image that just needed to get out because it's important that it gets out. You know, if, if, if she had spent 25 years making sure this painting was perfect, we would, it would have never addressed the situation. It's as if, it's as if she needed to make sure this was said, and and so we we are willing to to overcome the crassness. And to me, that crassness becomes all the more powerful in what it's doing. It it forces me to not think about beautiful flowers. It forces me to think about how can flowers be ugly? How can they be sharp as barbed wire? How can they be like a burial mound? instead of a bouquet especially like look at the center it's like this mixing like it's like a nebula in the middle there and it's like you know are you attracted to that or are you repulsed by it am i supposed to like fall in love with these flowers or am i supposed to run away because they're like almost like they're like barbed wire themselves are they going to pull me in And a little bit of that dripping, you know, like you said, does seem somewhat intentional. I mean, it does give it a little more depth down there at the bottom. If they, if it wasn't there, it would just be kind of this hollow area. Yeah. But it also kind of exposes, you know, it shows how the work was made, you know, 
and it shows that there was a hand involved, that there was a person there. And it wasn't, like you said, it wasn't this computer printout of something that was, you know, some AI kind of put it together. So it does even push that idea of humanness more, you know, and you see the, and, and, and when you acknowledge the material, you know, I think there's something to that also, you know, it's like a abstract expressionism when you can, you know, appreciate the fact that it's paint and it's, you know, and that's what it really is. It's not representation. It's, it's literally paint on a canvas. It's like, that's what these things do for me also. It may, it, for me, it's like telling the viewer that, no, this is a representation. This is not reality. This is, you know, this is made of watercolor. This is made in this specific way. It's kind of like the, um, the, is it, what's his name? The first, the Dupree, what's the, what's the guy who did the chalkboard paintings? What's his name? I can't remember his name right offhand. One of the first, first few artists that we talked about. Oh, Gage, Gage Del Gage, yeah, it's the same thing with him. Like he doesn't hide the fact that these are paintings, and he, like I said, you know, even in that video, I think I talked about how he's not being he he has made a choice not to be, um, like photorealistic, which he could right. probably easily do. He's decided to make it apparent that they no, these are paintings. These are made with, you know, acrylic or you know, whatever paint he was using and to kind of expose the way it's been made. You know, this idea of um, the de-skilling of artists, you know, I think there's there's something to that. And there's also something that I really just don't like about it at all. I think artists need to uh, be able to weld their brush and have uh, specific skills before they start kind of going off into, you know, whatever direction they want to go into. Um, but, you know, to me, that's this is what that's part of is the idea of de-skilling is the idea of a kind of exposing how you're creating something. You're not trying to hide it as much or you're not trying to right. cover it up in technique. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like hey, Molly has chops. You can see it even in oh, this yeah. like especially because I've I, in the last like three months, I've started working with this type of paper and it is uh, unruly especially with water-based mediums, like they just flow across it. And so there's, this looks seamless, but she is instituting a, a, an extreme control because she understands how to make it work. And there's, you know, like that's one of the things about the counter to de-skilling, so to speak, is like you need the skills to build the image or to build right. the artwork in a manner that it, looks as if it's crass you know because mm -hmm. i think about like that's the same thing as like cheap reproductions of what jackson pollock is doing you know i he didn't i don't think many of his paintings have as much skill as something like this is involved but even in that when people just think like oh i could throw paint at the canvas like it does not have the same right. presence right it's not the same because it's not this isn't just unintentional brush strokes or unintentional right. dripping it it's like it's understanding that there is a way to use those seemingly unintentional moments to benefit and then respond to them. You know, maybe the first drip was completely unintentional and then the subsequent drips were used in order to realize like dripping was necessary. You know, it's, it's, it's important that this feels like these flowers are coated in oil or blood and it's coming down them. And, and maybe she discovered that, you know, maybe she was trying really hard to not let that first drip go. And then suddenly it went and it was just this aha moment of, oh, this thing needs to be like weeping. Right. And like you've said before, you know, you talk about discovery and research. And that's another thing that I think a lot of people have a hard time with is the idea that visual artists are doing research in a way that that maybe other, you know, that scientists maybe do the same thing. They go through their experiments and they see what works and what doesn't work and they build on that. And it's the same thing with artists. You take a piece of paper, you take some watercolor and some gouache and you just start working on it and see what works and what doesn't. And then you keep building and building and building. And that to me is research and discovery just in any, just like a scientist would go through the process. Now it may not be, it may not cure cancer, <laughs> 
Yeah. It's curing something. It's curing some hurt inside. You know what I mean? Like you're right. creating these visual images and it's like you said, some of these images like bring a lot of hope to people and they can do the exact opposite as well, you know? So dismissing, I think sometimes artists, and I think this happens a lot, you know, people really want to, you know, sometimes want to really embrace art and talk about how great it is. But when the rubber hits the road, it's it's usually just a prop in order to get on to some other conversation. And I don't I don't dismiss that because I, I do the same thing myself and I enjoy artwork in that capacity as well. But, you know, artwork is more important than what people want. I think a lot of people want to apply to it. And I think some people get it and some people don't. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy with this show. I'm, I'm glad we've looked at it. It's, I was, I was worried like, cause it's challenging. We haven't looked at all of it, but I mean, hopefully folks will, cause this is, this is a weird one too. Yeah. It's like this super spreader, this like <laughs> infection of the touch amongst what appear to be nude bodies and some sort of she weird. Has, she line. has something going on in her head about systems, you know, there's yeah. something about the human form for her in my mind and maybe it would be it like all these artists it'd be worth eventually talking to them about it but these you know she she puts them all in a certain color and they all seem like they're like this one group and it's the connections that that they can transfer things to but they're still part of this like system the system like here the system's represented by the color and then how the the things transfer by, you know, by touch and things like that, but they're also in a row. So they're already in this kind of weird linear system already of transferring things. So it's, it's right. interesting that in, you know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, like we, you and I've talked about before, artists can do things that are super intuitive. Like they're not even like in there and we're such visual people that sometimes we don't even know how to put what we're talking about into words. Right. And, but to me, there's something going on with her whether she knows it or not about this idea of like hierarchies and systems and, and, and the, how the colors are symbolic and, and all it's all in there. And right, right. I have no doubt that she's, that she's thought about it or had conversations with other people about it, but it's, you know, like we've always said, and it's since the first you know video we've had, you know, you really got to take the time to try to see what the artist is communicating to you. And it's not going to, you know, you're not going to get that in a, looking at one work for 15 seconds or work, looking at an exhibition for, you know, 20 minutes. Or, well, and that's where, like, to me, it's like, I see this work and it's like, it would be so easy to pass by it because it, it feels uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, actually, maybe that's wrong. Maybe it's, it's hard to pass by it because if, I think a lot of, it's sort of like, you know, the car accident on the side of the road, like you have to look because you're like, what is, why is this, so disgusting um but there's something about it where like spending this much time with it like first of all i'm even more excited about this work now like i really think there's some some interesting things going on here and what you just said like i know molly's older work and my hope is that other people who listen to us will go and look at some of her older work which you can obviously see here on the left in her in her website because all like there, there are some specific projects. Like I'm thinking about flowers for difficult women and the man project where that is exactly what she's thinking about is especially the relationship between men and women and the, that sort of those hierarchies. And like, I just simply wanted to look at her most recent work that I know of, you know, obviously she's, I'm sure she's still working um, on new stuff that's different than this, but this was the most recent stuff I saw online. And I'm like, there's a power here. There's something, there's something going on that is really, I really want to spend some time and mull over. Um, and that's where to me, it's like the, the reward for mulling over a difficult artwork is in my opinion, frequently way more powerful and way more valuable than looking at something that is just really, really beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I agree. I think, I think the way she approaches her work is, is, is a way to um, grab people, you know, because she's, she's trying to be a little more challenging with people. 
But in the end, I think she's more of an optimist, you know, about mm -hmm. the future of, of what we're doing, you know, it, at least that's what I can, I can read from it. She may, she may not agree with that interpretation at all, but to me, like she's, she's showing us these things because she wants us to, to think about things and, to, and to, and to see that we can, you know, the birds to me, like do represent kind of like the people are kind of, that's they're grounded and they're stuck and they're, they can't do what we do. They can't just fly away and, and get away from it all. But at the same time, it's like, that, that isn't in the in the the history of the universe not just the earth or the people or the humans that like life goes on you know what i mean like things yeah. the things the world keeps turning and things keep happening whether we're here or not and you know that's and as a in a lifespan that's what we tell ourselves you know enjoy the time that you have and as human beings we should probably do the same thing enjoy the time that we have because we're probably not going to be here forever. Mm. Mm. But yeah, this was, Molly was good. And uh, I think, you know, we've had, had other challenging, I think, artists on here that we've talked about. Actually, the majority of them, I think, challenge us in some ways, or at least we can dig ourselves into yeah. thinking about ideas that are a little more challenging. But yeah, yeah she's definitely more direct. <laughs> yeah. Like it's uh, not... It's not metallic uh, blow up horses, you know, <laughs> that, that, that are bothering us or, you know, we can really enjoy that on a surface level, but it's hard to enjoy, you know, looking at her work immediately on the surface because there's, you can tell that she's, she has something more direct to say.